while we're asleep. Why not schedule it during the work day so that we could, we could all be happier about the hour we're losing? Wouldn't that make more sense? So today I want us to begin a movement to petition our legislature to change the hour we actually lose to during the work day. And then we can get the hour back while we sleep, as usual, but that would just make so much more sense, wouldn't it? All right, well, we are uh, we're coming now to uh, the final lesson in our survey of the Bible on its uh, teaching on homosexuality. We still have a number of other lessons after this one where we'll look at applying the teachings to our situation. Uh, but this will be the last time we're, we're focusing primarily on what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. And, and uh, after this Sunday, we will have a break from the series next Sunday. Um, it'll be my spring break, but I don't think it's Union spring break um, week after this coming week. So um, anyway, I'll be, I'll be out of town, but Timothy O'Day will be here to uh, teach on uh, Salt Lake City to talk to you about his, his plans, his and Haley's plans about all things related to Salt Lake City. Uh, it is going to be um, very worth your while to be here. Uh, and to get on board with what they're doing and their, their attempts to plant a church there. We, we are all part of this, and so I really want to encourage you to be here next week. It'll be an exciting time for our church to hear Timothy speak about that. In fact, I'd say it's, it's probably sinful if you're not here, um, <laughs> except for the fact that I won't be here. But I am going to watch it on, online, definitely, um, when it's over. It's, it's going to be a good Sunday. Then we'll get back to this series uh, the following week. Well, let's open with prayer, and then we'll see what the Apostle Paul has to say. Our Father, we ask you to give us understanding through your Spirit. We ask you to give us wisdom to obey the Scripture in all that it teaches, that we may revere every word that you have spoken, and that we may meet the challenges that are facing us in our present age. Give us courage to stand for truth. Give us love to proclaim the gospel to a world that needs Christ. And give us the ability to fight sin in ourselves and in each other as we labor together on our journey toward the celestial city. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul addresses homosexuality directly more frequently than does any other biblical author. Moreover, as apostle to the Gentiles, Paul's teaching has more direct bearing on our situation than any other uh, teaching, any other section of the Bible, because he's writing to New Covenant believers, which we are. He's writing to Gentile believers, which we are. And thus the situation that, that he's writing to in his, in his letters much more nearly matches ours than any other situation you might see in, say, Leviticus, or even in the teachings of Jesus. There are two ways that Paul's teaching on homosexuality are uh, attempted to be evaded by some today. The first way is simply to denial that Paul's writings have authority over us. Um, one way would be to just deny biblical authority in general. And so someone might come to Paul's writings and say, yes, Paul condemned homosexuality. And wasn't he silly? That's one way to approach it. Um, that view we will address in a future lesson, uh, the, the outright denial of biblical authority. I will address that issue later. Another way would be a try to, trying to hold some kind of biblical authority, but to do it in such a way that Paul has lesser authority than Jesus. And, and I talked about this approach last week, where uh, the view is that Jesus' words have greater authority in the Bible. They're, they become a canon within a canon. And Jesus is supposed, on this view, even though it's not true to what Jesus actually taught, Jesus is supposed to have affirmed homosexuality by not saying anything directly about it. And therefore, Jesus trumps Paul. Uh, we addressed that view last week. It's not true to who Jesus is, and it constitutes an implicit denial of biblical authority because it claims that one part of the Bible can contradict another, which would therefore entail that God can contradict Himself. So we, we, will, we addressed that in part last week. We'll address it later also when we talk about biblical authority in general. 
But the second way then, that's the, the first way then, deny Paul's authority. The second way that Paul's teaching has been evaded is to say, yes, Paul's writings have authority over us, and Paul never condemned consensual homosexual relationships. Uh, consen usually consensual, monogamous, homosexual relationships. That's the, the idea that's, that's thrown out sometimes. Uh, if, if somebody has a homosexual orientation, they enter into mon a monogamous relationship and it's consensual between both parties, Paul never had anything negative to say about that. That, that claim is what we'll address today from Paul's writings. So before we look at Paul's writings in particular, I want to give two uh, preliminary observations that help us uh, put Paul in his context. The first would be Paul's Jewish background, and I alluded to this last week. It is widely agreed that homosexuality is strongly and universally condemned in Judaism from this period, especially the first century. Uh, I read these two quotes last week. I'll read them again. Two examples of the condemnation of homosexuality among first century Jews. Josephus writes, The law recognizes only sexual intercourse that is according to nature. That's a key phrase. That'll come up in Paul as well. Actually, the, the reverse of that, contrary to nature, comes up with Paul. But Josephus speaks of sexual intercourse that is according to nature, that which is with a woman, and that only for procreation of children but it abhors the intercourse of males with males. Philo, a first century Jew, also wrote about Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet God, because He had taken pity as Savior and lover of humankind, increased in the highest degree possible the unions of men and women which were in accordance with nature, unions having come into being for the sake of the procreation of children. But because He bitterly hated those unions which were strange and unlawful, He extinguished them. So the argument I'm making here is that if Paul held a different view from what was the mainstream view among first century Jews, if he wanted to really go against the grain of his own culture, his own upbringing, he would have to make that abundantly clear in his writings, uh, just as he does with circumcision. Uh, you read the, the letter to the Galatians, uh, he is very strong that circumcision is not a requirement for us to be Christians. And he makes that in very oftentimes colorful language. Um, so Paul, when he wants to make a point that is against what first century Judaism holds, he makes his point, and he's not afraid to come out swinging in making it. So if he were going to make the same point about homosexuality, we would expect him to come out swinging, but he never does. So that already gives us an implicit reason to assume that Paul's view is in line with what first century Judaism was. So that's one preliminary observation. The second one is uh, something I just want to mention briefly today. We will pick it up in more detail at the next lesson. But that would be Paul's positive teaching on gender complementarity. Complementarity referring to the, the fact that male and female complete each other. Um, Compliment spelled with an E, not with an I. Compliment with an I means you say something nice about somebody. And certainly men and women should compliment each other in that way, but that's not the sense in which I'm using the term. I'm using the term in, in the sense of completing, just like complementary angles complete one another. Uh, Paul teaches that male and female complete one another. And uh, he does so uh, especially in the marriage context in Ephesians 5. 22 to 33, we'll see that in more detail in the next lesson. But he also speaks of male-female differences in worship and the importance of maintaining that in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, when he's writing about the issue of head coverings. We'll look at that in more detail. And in 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, uh, he speaks of, of uh, the office of pastor and how it's restricted to men, and he gives a, a reason for that that's grounded in creation. And we'll, we'll address that uh, in more detail as well. So those are just two preliminary observations that would, would incline us already to assume that Paul opposes homosexuality. And we should read then, um, in, in the three passages we're going to look at today, we should read those then in light of that context and uh, understand them that way. So the three key passages in which Paul addresses homosexuality directly are Romans 1, 
18 to 32. Romans 1, 18 to 32. And I'll write these on the board as we go. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, and 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. So we'll start then with Romans 1. Eighteen to thirty-two. This is not a passage that is directly about homosexuality. Paul didn't sit down and decide, oh, I need to write something about homosexuality. He's writing about a bigger topic, namely the revelation of God's wrath against sinful humanity. God has a contention against a rebellious world, and Paul is going to build a case against humanity in Romans 1.18 to 3.20 before he then gets to his exposition of the gospel, or actually I should say, this is part of his exposition of the gospel by speaking of the wrath of God revealed against humanity, and then in chapter 3, 21 and following, uh, he speaks of justification by faith. And he's going to begin, before he gets to the bad news, I mean the good news, he's going to begin with the bad news here. So in, in Romans 1, 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And his point so far is simply to indicate that all men are accountable to God because we have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness, the truth that is made plain to us in creation itself, the truth about God. So what specifically has mankind done that uh, represents the suppression of the truth about God? Paul goes on to say uh, in verses 21 to 23, that uh, men are essentially denying that God is God and are, are worshiping something else instead. So in, in, in verse 21 he says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So this is a, an exchange of the Creator for the creature. And that's what Paul indicts humanity for here. Then he goes on to spell out three cycles of this denial of God. He, he speaks three different times of humanity denying God, exchanging God for something else, worshiping the creature rather than the Creator. He says it in three different ways. And every time he speaks of a consequence of God, uh, of, of what we have done, a consequence of God then handing us over to our sin. And every time he, he comes back to this cycle, it's very interesting, the way he describes it, the punishment always fits the crime. There's always some kind of link between the way he gives the punishment and the crime that is mentioned. So look with me at uh, the first cycle here, which is uh, 20, verses 21 to 24. Actually, we, we just read 21 to 23. Just notice that in 23 again it says, And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, idols, graven images that, that we worship. What do those idols resemble? Well, he mentioned several things, but one of those things is mortal man. So one of the ways that humanity has denied the glory of God is by worshiping images of man, uh, uh, elevating man, elevating the human body to an object of worship. So what does God do in response? He hands them over to the dishonoring of their bodies as a fitting punishment for this crime. Verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. He doesn't go into detail of what that means yet, but uh, just note here that, that it speaks of dishonoring their bodies. So that's the first cycle. The second cycle is in verses 25 to 27, where it says, Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, 
and worshiped and served the creator rather than the creature. Uh, sorry, worship and served the creature. That was, uh, that was like totally wrong. I mean, you can slip up sometimes, but sometimes you can really slip up in the way you read things. Serve the creator rather... Again, I did it again. <laughs> worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Um... So what does God do? It is because they worship the creature rather than the Creator, God hands them over to a corruption of His design in creation for human sexuality. Because they pervert their understanding of Creator and creature, He allows them then to pervert what He created, what He ordered in creation for sexuality. It goes on to say, um, verse uh, 26, For this reason... God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So that's the second cycle. The third then is in verses 28 to 32. Notice what it says in verse 28. And since they did, not, they, they did not see fit to acknowledge God, so that's an act of the mind, because they did not acknowledge God with their minds, God gave them up to a debased mind. Their mind is in rebellion against God. He gives them up to a debased mind. The punishment fits the crime again. To do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so in three cycles, Paul is condemning human idolatry here. And uh, he's doing it as a way of building a case against all humanity. Here he's speaking of sins that are are more typically associated with uh, Gentile pagans. But he's he's on his way to building a case against Jews as well because he's going to make the point in the very next chapter that uh, Jews who condemn Gentiles for these things practice the very same things just usually in different forms. And and by the end of chapter 3, he's making the point that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. And so he's building a case against all humanity, and in this passage he takes his first step in that overall argument. Now, for our purposes today, the key verses, of course, are verses 26 and 27, which uh, speak of both female and male homosexual acts. Uh, My argument here is that these verses condemn all kinds of homosexual activity by characterizing them as perverse consequences of a deeper sin of false worship. So Paul, as I said, he did not set out to write a treatise on homosexuality. He's writing about worship here. He's writing about one exchange leading to another. The exchange of God for the created thing leads then to God giving us over to our sins so that we exchange what is natural for what is contrary to nature. In other words, it's as though God is saying, I'm taking my hands off. I'm going to give you over to experience the full consequences of your rebellion. And so homosexuality is pictured here Not so much as a sin, it is a sin, but it's not pictured here as the sin itself, but rather as the perverse consequence of a deeper sin that is itself, homosexual behavior, is itself an expression of the wrath of God in this present time. Now how is it an expression of the wrath of God? Do people who are involved in homosexual activity think of themselves as under God's wrath? Not necessarily. But Paul does make the point in in the next chapter in verse 5, Romans 2, 5, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath 
when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So there is coming a day of judgment. And Paul is writing of those whom God gave over in Romans 1. He is speaking of them being given over to their sin so that they might fill up the measure of their sin before the day of wrath comes upon them. It's really a frightening, frightening view of homosexuality that Paul is giving us in these verses. Well, there have been arguments that, that this is actually not what Paul means. Uh, some have argued that Paul is actually uh, condemning one kind of homosexuality, but, but not the kind that we know today, committed, faithful, monogamous, consensual homosexuality. So I want to address those arguments in particular. The first argument would be that Paul only condemns here exploitative, coercive, homosexual acts, such as uh, pederasty. Pederasty would be the uh, sexual relationship of a man with a boy. Was widely practiced in the Greco-Roman world, but is that the only thing Paul is condemning here? And is he viewing uh, the, the boy in that relationship as a victim, as one who's being abused by an older man? In the Greco-Roman world, it would not be viewed that way. Uh, the boys were not seen as victims. Uh, today, because we live in a, in a society that has been so deeply shaped in our moral uh, bearing for centuries by Christianity, we are abhorred by that idea, uh, which is why when something that, like what happens at Penn State uh, with the football coach, when something like that happens, there is, there is a, a public outcry, and then uh, there, there's all kinds of actions that are taken, and the man who is responsible is in jail now, rightly so, but in the Greco-Roman world, that, nobody would have batted an eye when they heard about this kind of thing. It was a much, much more common practice. But is that the only thing Paul is condemning, or is he condemning homosexuality more broadly? Uh, others would say it's not necessarily um, pederasty. It could include pederasty, but it could also include cult prostitution. That's the kind of homosexuality he's condemning. Well, this first argument that he's only condemning certain kinds of homosexuality, it doesn't work for two reasons. The first is in verse 26. Paul mentions lesbianism first here. Their women, he says, exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Female homosexuality in the ancient world would not typically have been exploitative and coercive as we, we have an imagination that male homosexual, homosexuality, especially pederasty, might be. Female homosexuality was not at all. Um, so Paul, by condemning lesbianism first, shows that he's addressing the broader subject, not just these particular forms of it. Uh, and certainly lesbianism is not associated with cult prostitution at all, in any, in any way that I'm aware of in the first century. So uh, that shows uh, by one observation. The second one is that in verse 27, notice he doesn't present either side as a victim, but he presents both participants in the acts as worthy of condemnation. He says, men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. So there's passion in both directions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men. He doesn't say men with boys. Men committing shameless acts with men and both receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. I added the word both, but it's clearly implied there that Paul means both parties are involved here. So Paul is condemning all homosexual activity. He's not condemning just exploitative or, or coercive kinds that involve a victim. In addition, the verse 26 makes it clear he's not condemning just cult prostitution as well. The second argument is that Paul only condemns homosexual acts between those who have a heterosexual orientation. This is a little bit of a bizarre argument, but let me show you where it comes from. Um, look, at, uh, look at verse 26 again. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Here's how the argument goes. Natural relations means what you yourself subjectively are naturally inclined to. So 
If you're heterosexual, you're naturally inclined to the opposite sex. If you're homosexual, you're naturally inclined to the same sex. So what Paul is actually condemning, so this argument says, is that those who were naturally heterosexual, who were naturally inclined to the opposite sex, nevertheless went for the same sex. So they went contrary to their own orientation, their own nature, and that's what Paul condemns. This argument won't work as well. Uh, for the main reason that it misreads Paul's use of nature language. Nature in Paul does not have anything to do with your own subjective preferences. That's a modernized way of understanding nature. Uh, Josephus and Philo both speak of sexual relations according to nature uh, in the quotes that I read earlier. They're speaking of what God created to be natural. The natural complementarity between male and female that is evident in the way our bodies are made. That is what Paul is addressing here. So, so natural, what is natural, what is according to nature, is what is according to the way we were created, not what our subjective preferences are. And therefore, what is contrary to nature uh, would be acting against what we were created uh, for. Uh, in addition, verse 27 also makes it very difficult to sustain that argument because it not only, it, it mentions... Uh, these men committing shameless acts with men, but notice that it mentions specifically that they were consumed with passion for one another, which would indicate that these, these are not homosexual men who are, who are acting against, I'm sorry, did I say, these are not heterosexual men who are acting against their, their inward disposition. Their inward disposition is directing them in this direction. They are, they are consumed with passion for one another. It, it doesn't fit uh, the, the reading of what Paul is saying here. So that's the second argument. The third argument that is often made about Paul here is that in the ancient world there was no concept of orientation as we speak of sexual orientation today. So if Paul did not understand that there was such a thing as a homosexual orientation, but if he had known about it, then he would have affirmed committed homosexual relationships. That's the argument. Problems with that argument are a number of things, but the first, the main problem, is that it presumes the ability to read Paul's mind in spite of his words. Whenever you start doing that, you have pretty much rejected biblical authority. Keep that in mind. When you start trying to read the minds of the author of the Bible in spite of what their words actually say, uh, you're, you're into dangerous territory. But in any case, I do think there was at least some concept of a homosexual orientation in the first century. I've heard N.T. Wright say, um, everything that we have today, they had in the ancient world. Um, now, we have, we have uh, morphed and modified the idea a bit. We've made it into much more of an identity issue today, which is, really doesn't speak highly of us. I think the ancient world had a lot more wisdom than we do, on this issue, but, uh, but they did have a, a, an understanding, at least some concept of this idea of, homo, of uh, homosexual or heterosexual orientation. Uh, Plato's Symposium, for example, uh, there's a speaker in that work named Aristophanes who speaks of a, a myth that recounts the original binary nature of human beings. So, so every human being is made up of two parts. Some were originally male-male, some were originally female-female, and some were originally male-female, according to Aristophanes. Well, Zeus cut everybody in half. So now on earth there are males who are seeking their other half in females. They were originally male-female, so they, they're seeking to reunite with their other half. But there are also males who are seeking to reunite with males. There are females who are seeking to reunite with females. Uh, so this idea shows there, there was at least some conception of an orientation. Uh, Pausanias of Athens had a homosexual relationship with a man named Agathon. And it was a committed, monogamous, homosexual relationship that lasted well into their adulthood. Uh, if you, you've uh, read uh, the Iliad or heard of the Iliad, um, Achilles and Patroclus are very close friends uh, very dear friends in this work. Now there's, there's no, really no suggestion in the work itself that the author, Homer, intended them to be seen as homosexual, but later Greek writers certainly interpreted it that way. So by the time of Plato, for example, you have 
Plato speaking of, of uh, Achilles and Patroclus as homosexual men in a relationship with one another. So everything that you can imagine that we have today, they knew about it. They had it back then. So the argument that, well, real homosexuality as we know it today it just never existed in the ancient world, uh, that, that's a bit silly. It, it did. And if you, if you talk to anyone outside of those who are trying to make the Bible fit what their argument is today, I think uh, most any scholar would agree that they clearly had these conceptions back then. So my conclusion from Romans 1 is that Paul condemns all homosexual activity as sinful evidence of God's wrath against idolatry in Romans 1. So that one was the, the longest passage. We'll be able to move quickly through the next two. The second passage is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And here, uh, Paul has just addressed a matter of, of sexual immorality in the church at Corinth in chapter 5. He's going to address another matter of sexual immorality uh, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 6. So, so this section is bracketed by two sections that address sexual immorality in the church. And in between this, he's writing about lawsuits within the church. There are believers taking each other to court, and Paul is instructing them, condemning them, and, asking, and, and, and commanding them not to do this. And in the context, he broadens out more, more broadly to, um, to address uh, wickedness in general. And he gives us in these passages, uh, the, these verses here, verses 9 through 11, what is called a vice list. As we, we saw one of those in Romans 1, where he just lists off vice after vice after vice. And here we have a vice list uh, beginning in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So in the context of this vice list, Paul uses four different terms that refer specifically to sexual sin. He speaks of the sexually immoral first, just a broad general term to refer to all sexual sin. Then he will speak of, after idolaters, he'll speak of adulterers. Then we have this, this uh, phrase in the ESV that says, nor men who practice homosexuality. There Paul actually uses two different Greek words. Uh, he uses, uh, a, for, for example, in the, the King James Version it says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So two, these, the, the King James translating both terms. The NIV says, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. Well, here are the two terms that are used. The first term he uses is the, word, the Greek word malakoi, which uh, refers to men or boys who offer themselves willingly to other men to be receptive in a sexual act. Uh, so uh, this is a, 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 a word that would refer to one partner in a homosexual activity. The other word he uses is arsenakoitai, which is a word that's built on two words. Actually, Paul may have actually coined this term. Uh, it's it's uh, only used in Paul, as far as I'm aware, in the New Testament. Uh, but it's a word, it seems to be built on two words that come from Leviticus in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, the word that means man, and the other word that means lie with a man. Uh, arsena koitai, put them together, and you have essentially what Paul is saying, man layers is the word he comes up with to refer to it. So he's speaking of the active partner in a homosexual relationship. So he's he identifying here the, the two sides of the equation, if you will. Um, I think the NIV goes a little bit off when it speaks of the first word as male prostitutes. There's no reason to restrict the first word to male prostitutes. Uh, it, it would refer to anyone, whether prostitute or not, who's involved in this activity. 
Uh, so, Paul, notice here, is that he's condemning both partners in this. He's not saying that one of them's a victim and the other one's guilty. He's saying both sides of this equation are guilty. Uh, so he's speaking here of consensual acts. He's not speaking of those who've been victimized. He's speaking of those who are consenting to these acts. And, and he's condemning uh, both of them. If, if he wanted to specify specifically that he was referring to uh, pederists, men who seek out boys, he had a Greek word available for that, but he did not use it. He, he chose a more general term that refers to anyone uh, who would, who would involve, involve themselves in this activity. So what exactly is the condemnation that Paul pronounces here? Verse 9 again, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. At the end of verse 10, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you see why this is such an important issue? Do you see how much you have to hate somebody to affirm somebody in this behavior? How much do you have to hate somebody to affirm them in something that is going to result in them being excluded from the kingdom of God? If we do not take a stand against this, we are blessing people on their way to hell. So says the Apostle Paul. But the good news that Paul gives is that none of us None of us are determined, whether biologically or otherwise, none of us are determined to be stuck in this kind of behavior, this kind of lifestyle. Because he'll go on to say in verse 11, and such were some of you. Some of you Corinthians, you were all these things that I just listed. But what happened to you? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When people argue that this, this behavior, this lifestyle cannot be changed, the Apostle Paul says otherwise. The Apostle Paul says the gospel changes people. The gospel washes, justifies, sanctifies those who are involved in all kinds of sin. And the gospel can deliver anyone. It, it delivered us. It can deliver anyone from sin. So if we are going to proclaim the gospel faithfully in this age, and I'm anticipating what we'll get to in a couple of weeks, but if we are going to do this faithfully, we must regard homosexual practice as sinful and call people out of it and tell them that in the gospel they can be delivered. It may not be an easy thing. And we're not necessarily saying that, that you're going to become suddenly heterosexual and you're going to get married and you're going to have a happy marriage. That may never happen. But what we do know is that the gospel can deliver you. Whatever that looks like in your, your own life, whatever that looks like, faithful obedience may look different for different people, but the gospel can deliver you from what will exclude you otherwise from the kingdom of God. The last uh, passage we're going to look at then is 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 11. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. Here Paul is addressing uh, false teachers who have infiltrated the church apparently at uh, Ephesus that he's writing to Timothy. Uh, and apparently these false teachers had some Jewish characteristics about them. They might have been Jews uh, or they had a devotion to Judaism of some kind. Uh, but Paul is addressing the fact that they misuse the law. And so he tells us in chapter 1 verse 8... Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the unjust, uh, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. And there he's speaking in general terms. Now what is he saying here? He's saying the law is given to sinners. That's who the law is for. If we were not sinners... If we were all perfected in righteousness, we would not need a law. Like I mentioned in an earlier lesson, are we going to need a law in heaven that tells us not to murder each other, not to commit adultery, not to do all these things? No, we're, we're going to love God from the heart. So Paul says here 
that the law is laid down for the unjust. It exposes and restrains the sin of the unjust. And he gives in general terms who they are. And then he goes on to describe more specifically what the unjust do. And as he's doing this, he's following uh, the order of the Ten Commandments. He begins with the uh, Fifth Commandment. Uh, Notice what it says uh, in verse uh, 9 toward the end. For those who strike their fathers and mothers, that's a violation of the Fifth Commandment. For murderers, that's a violation of the Sixth Commandment. The sexually immoral, that's a violation of the Seventh Commandment. Then he adds another one there. Men who practice homosexuality, also violating the Seventh Commandment. Enslavers, that would be those who kidnap, who steal people to sell them into slavery. That's stealing, that's a violation of the Eighth Commandment. Liars, perjurers, violation of the Ninth Commandment. And whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, with which I have been entrusted. Just a brief observation here that, again, the word in verse 10 that he uses for men who commit homosexuality is the same word he had used in 1 Corinthians 6, arsenakoitai, those who, who um, are the active partners in male homosexual relationships. So Paul envisions the seventh commandment more broadly. You shall not commit adultery. He's envisioning it more broadly condemning all kinds of sexual sin. So I just wanted to, to draw something out here as we, we finish up this survey on Paul. In all three of these letters we've looked at, and in all three contexts, again, Paul did not set out to write just about this issue. He's treating this issue in passing as he's writing about other things. And his focus in all three contexts is on the gospel. The gospel is central to what Paul writes about in his letters. Uh, in the book of Romans... As I mentioned earlier, he's on his way building a case against humanity so that he may show how the righteousness of God has been revealed in Christ in chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians 6, we saw it there. He's he's giving this vice list, but he mentions to the Corinthians, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified. So again, the gospel is at the forefront of his mind. Here in 1 Timothy, as he's writing about the improper use of the law, He is uh, overall, what is his overall aim? In verse 5 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. He is seeking then to shape the doctrine of the church at Ephesus so that it is shaped by the gospel and leads to the proper expression of love in the community as opposed to what the false teachers are doing. So in all three cases, Paul has his heart ultimately on the gospel. Now that brings me to to just apply this this point uh, to, to our situation. There are two major ways that we can fail here with regard to homosexuality. Two ditches we can fall into. The first ditch and the one that may be the more obvious one is that we could affirm that it's okay. We could take the position of compromise and say that that this behavior, nothing wrong with it, as long as it's committed, faithful, monogamous, consensual, so forth. To do that, as I've already mentioned, is to bless people on their way to hell. But the other ditch that is just as wrong and just as destructive is to regard those who are involved with, with homosexual behavior as beyond redemption. That is every bit as much a denial of the gospel as is the first one. They are not beyond redemption. If you are struggling with this, you are not beyond redemption. The gospel of Christ can deliver anyone. Anyone. It it delivered me. It delivered a, a room full of sinners here. And we are all messed up in different ways. We are all sexually messed up in different ways. And the gospel delivers us. It can deliver anyone. We need to keep the gospel central as we approach this issue. And we'll talk more about that as we get to the future lessons of applying uh, specifically then to our context. So let me just summarize what we've seen in the last four weeks. I'm, I'm going to give you now, this is my, my summary of a comprehensive biblical case for the, uh, the condemnation of all homosexual activity. First, it's condemned explicitly in the Old Testament. We saw that in Leviticus uh, 18 and 20. 
uh, it's condemned explicitly. Second, that condemnation is rooted in the order of creation. Uh, it's rooted in the way God designed male and female. We see from Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, you also see implicit confirmation of this point in the fact that God declared He was going to judge the nations, the Canaanite nations, for their immoral sexual practices. Uh, and that would indicate that those, those sexual practices that, that were immoral are not just immoral under the Sinai Covenant, but immoral at all times and places. So that's two points. The third would be the, the negative portrayal of homosexuality or attempted homosexual acts throughout the Old Testament. Every time it's mentioned, it's mentioned in a negative context. The fourth is that Jesus' silence on the issue, never addressing it directly, would imply that he agrees with the teaching of the Old Testament and Judaism, not that he disagrees. The fifth point is that Jesus affirms the Genesis 2 pattern of marriage, as we saw last week. And then the sixth point is that Paul clearly condemns homosexuality strongly and more comprehensively than any other biblical writer. So my conclusion is that Scripture condemns all homosexual practice, not just some kinds, but every kind of homosexual practice. So, what are we going to do with that? If we are going to affirm the legitimacy of homosexual practice, as the culture is pressing on us every day to do, more and more each day, if we are going to ever affirm that it's okay, we have to do so only against the clear teaching of Scripture. Those are our two options. We can go with Scripture or with the culture. But I hope it is abundant, not just clear, I hope it is abundantly clear to you how pervasive and how, how clear the Scripture is on this issue. Uh, for us to try to rationalize it away is clear, simple disobedience to God. And that's what I, I wanted to establish that before we move forward because I know that arguments are out there, arguments are being made, and at some point, they, those arguments will come to you. You may hear them. Uh, you may think, well, what if so-and-so is right about this passage? What if so-and-so is right? The, the case is clear. It's abundant. The only way to get around it is by attempting to rationalize sinful behavior and misinterpret the Scripture uh, to justify what one already knows is wrong. So uh, that was the purpose then of the last several weeks. And as we move forward into uh, future lessons, we'll be looking at applying now these teachings to our setting with issues of, of how do we relate to one another as male and female? How do we meet the challenge of same-sex marriage in our society? How do, we, um, how do we reach out to those who are struggling with this? How do we minister to those in our own church who are struggling with this? How would you, if you're struggling with this, deal with this in your own life? And uh, how do we stand firm uh, as the culture is continually pressing against us? Well, I think I've run out of time today. That was my strategy. The question has been so hard the last few weeks that my strategy was just to go so long that there would be no time for questions. But uh, if you do have a question, feel free to let me know after class or email or something. I'll be glad to talk with you. You're dismissed.